Welcome back, Whappers. See, I didn't want to say okay. I've been saying okay every single time. I was going to say something different. I'm going to try not to say okay at the very beginning, but I just said okay like four times. That's five. Okay. <laughs> See, I did it again. How am I going to stop that? I'm going to say okay a lot. See, I would never know that if I wasn't doing these videos. See what you learn? This is Unit 1, First Humans, First Farmers, and First Civilizations, and this is the last of the first unit, which is kind of nice to finish up here and be done. And you're probably about ready for the test. So we're getting you ready and prepared for it. The first group of uh, civilizations that we looked at in, in the first part of this <clears throat> was only Egypt and Mesopotamia. Now we're going to hit the Indus Valley, China, Norte Chico, and the Olmec civilizations. And we're going to do this pretty quickly. One of the things I'll mention to you is focus in on Strayer. If it's in Strayer, you need to know it for the test. Um, or at least be real familiar with them. I, I would say, you know, massive focus on Egypt and Mesopotamia. Because, well, you know, I'm not, this is three chapters. I'm not going to make a test that has like, um, 50 questions from each chapter. I mean, there's going to be about maybe 40 some questions at the most. So focus your study. Remember also that uh, there are those a couple websites with really good review questions on them. And there are some links on the website to kind of get you focused in on that. If you look at the notes part, I'll be putting them out there. So here we have the toilet bowl of Norte Chico. I shouldn't say that because someone's going to get mad and say, are you calling my civilization a toilet bowl, Mr. Duez? I'm not, but that looks a little bit like one there on the screen. It's a circular piece and I'm not so sure what that even means. I, we're all learning about Norte Chico a little bit more every day. Um, there is a little bit in Strayer about it. There'll be much more when we talk about the Chavin de Hunter or uh, Chavin uh, folks. And they'll be coming here in the variation uh, section of the chapter 7, I believe, for us in the first edition. So we're going to go through 4, 5, and 6, which are the classical era. The Chavin, or Chavin people of Peru, are the next incarnation of these folks down there along the west coast of South America, which is Peru today. Below this is the Indus Valley River Civilization. I had a few students ask me about the documents in Strayer. Do we need to read those? Do we need to know those for the test? I would flip through them and be familiar with them because they may help you understand this civilization for sure. Many of the uh, documents and visual documents, the visual sources, are over the Indus Valley people. So I want to mention them here. Above and to the right of them is, anybody know what this is? This kind of looks like a garbage dump or a landfill, but it's not. These are <coughs> oracle bones, and we'll discuss that here with China. China also below there with the Great Wall, and they start to kind of build that after the beginning of this first civilization, and it gets off the ground with the first emperor. On the right side is at the top a big head, but it's more the jaguar type. I'm not sure that that's as large, anywhere near as large, as some of the big heads that are just down below there, as we call them the Old Mexicans, or Olmex, also in Guatemala. There are your six uh, early civilizations. Remember, they're all occurring kind of on their own across the world at about a similar time period. So between 3,500 to 1,000 BCE, before the Common Era, these are the six civilizations that emerge. And they're all, if you listen, near water. So Griff is helping out. My dog's over here drinking some water. And you can hear the water kind of lapping. Uh, he's ready to go to the dog park. So i got to get this finished. Well, we focused on the two orange here. Orange you glad. In the last video, the other two orange over here in this area we'll get to in a, in a second. And also then uh, the two orange over here, the Olmec and Norte Chico. So let's check it out. Indus Valley is the civilization in the Indus or Saswati 
river valleys, and I probably said that wrong, sorry, as far as we're already. Uh, this is present day Pakistan, and this is around 2000 BCE. As we're going to learn, India, Pakistan has not been kind of divided just yet, and it will be in history here in the spring. We have a lot of information about this very advanced civilization. Unfortunately, we don't have enough to make a solid statement about some of the same types of things that we discussed with Egypt and with Mesopotamia. We can make some educated guesses and some estimates, but one of the issues here is the lack of a deciphered writing system. And you can see the writing system down there at the bottom or the similar kind of like pictographs there. No one to this day has really been able to decode that and understand most of it to give us the kind of information that we already possess with um, the Indus, or no, sorry, the uh, Mesopotamians and the different city-states there, and certainly nowhere near the Egyptians. So this is an issue. This is uh, sort of like makes the Indus Valley uh, folks very mysterious and interesting. Their civilization kind of dries up too. And it's not a long-lasting civilization in terms of the, that location, the Indus Valley, continuing with the same people's uh, lineage since the beginning here with them. Uh, there are certainly uh, people in this area and in India that, that may be related or come from these civilizations today. But a lot of Indo-European, meaning uh, folks from India and Europe that have kind of migrated together have kind of formed what the present day makeup of Pakistan, India, that area is today. Like I said, there obviously are some descendants, but it's not the same contiguous civilization. The seals right there, and we're not talking about the kind of seals that you would have on like a, a door or on a refrigerator door, the seal along the edge, or seals that you might find in San Francisco. We're talking about a seal that you would stamp or, or to seal a deal with. And in this case, those two are from this area. And of course, they are swastikas, which is a symbol of the sun. And there you can view it in different kinds of ways. Of course, our main man, Adolf Hitler, who is not our main man, is he? He kind of uh, lifts and steals this symbol because he believes that the folks of Germany are descended from this Aryan race. And um, he thinks that there's a connection here and that symbol's kind of... There is really not a connection in any way that we can find historically or uh, ge geologically speaking, uh, or ge genealogically speaking. We've got two figures there at the bottom, and you'll find them in the visual sources. The first on the left is the dancing girl of Mahinjadaro. And she doesn't look like she's dancing there, but she looks like she may have a, a boxing glove on. But um, this person who's being depicted there um, is from, uh, and it's today it's in Mumbai, India. Um, but it's real interesting, the depiction there and what the artistic form says about that. We're not really sure a, a lot about what it means. The man on the right there is the Mahinjadaro man. This is an India, an Indus, Indus, sorry, priest king uh, statue, and it's about 17.5 centimeters high, so it's not very big. And the statue is carved from um, steatite, or AKA soapstone. So I think it's very delicate in some ways, and not like it's not like certainly a very hard. Rock. It, it was found in 1927 in Mahinjadaro, and you might think to yourself, wow, that's not really that long ago, and it isn't, and it's on display today in Pakistan. So the top picture there is the evidence that remains and what's been excavated from the site. So if you look at the image on the right, which is sort of that Google map image of uh, the Indus River Valley, you'll notice some things here first. It's a very dry area to begin with. But you see some green kind of stretching down, uh, I guess it's this direction, or this direction for you guys. I can't do this very well because uh, it's the opposite for me. It wouldn't be this, it would be this. So it's, <laughs> I can't do it. Let's just draw on the, with the arrow. Stretching down this way towards the coast. The monsoon seasons are going to create um, trading patterns later on. 
But those winds also bring with them rains. And when it would rain, that's where you get the flooding of this, this plain as well. So in the Indus River Valley civilization, in South Asia, as Mesopotamia and Egypt are um, thriving and coming about, so is the Indus River Valley civilization, very similar time period. So about twice a year, you would get this major flooding, and it kind of goes with the wind, winds of the monsoon periods. In April, you would get melting snow. In August, you'd get a great monsoon, the great winds, which would bring more rains. So it's real interesting how the flooding would flow. You get two periods of time where there could be a great bit of uh, moisture coming into this valley that you could harness and grow crops and support a very large population. And they do it very well here in the Indus River Valley. Uh, from what we can decipher and tell from just the architectural elements that have been left behind, they've done a f they did a fantastic job of creating a very um, amazing culture, but it didn't last very long. So this idea of how what happened to them has always fascinated uh, archaeologists, anthropologists, and historians. Major cities of this area are Harappa and Mohenjo-daro. They date back to 3,300 BC, and it represents some of the largest human habitations of the ancient world. This there was this is a major set of cities here. There's nothing to sneeze at. And it's not just like uh, one of these throwaway river valley civilizations, nothing much happened here, let's move on. You do need to focus on these guys and think about them. They are very often on the AP test. And there's great reason for that because they're still fascinating to this day. And, and I think they're a good um, link to the ideas of um, that, that follow in the next semester that we'll study in the, in the history of this this. Uh, region in this area and some of the problems that happened here. Um, so, Northwest India and Pakistan, which is just uh, to the north of the line there. I believe this is the, the border here uh, between India and Pakistan. So, what do you have? You have a territory here that mostly is in Pakistan, but some of the overlapped into Northwest India. These coastal settlements were very very important and they were a tremendous trading location not just with um, the region in this river valley civilization but there's good evidence of that throughout even back towards the Middle East so good example here a good picture of the ruins of Mahinjadaro the high brick walls that surround the city they lay out in a very rigid uniform and grid like fashion I would say the streets of Mahinjadaro were um, probably better surveyed and laid down and laid out than most of Houston is. I mean, these are well-planned streets, not like the kinds of uh, urban development we see in the Houston area, which is mostly just build whatever you want and, you know, whatever. This is uh, well thought out. There's a much greater quantity of metal in these areas than in Mesopotamia, or in Egypt, but there's less jewelry that's been found and other decorative objects. And I wonder why. Well, some of it may be due to the climate and what we've been able to find from behind. It might be just a cultural thing. But they had a very complex system of writing that I have mentioned already has yet to be deciphered. So that's something you could do in the summer. Maybe and make some extra money. Or like become pretty famous. There you go. Here is the Mahindradara man, the statue of a seated man wearing a cloak and a headband that was carved from soft stone and it's called the priest king because some scholars believe it must have represented somebody uh, represented someone who was religious or secular authority the true identity of the person is unknown the oft often the thought is who is going to go to the kind of lengths that they want to hear to carve someone um, is it going to be just a regular average Joe um, Mahinjo Daro or is it going to be a person who maybe was famous or a leader or someone very important? I mean, just look at the kind of sculptures and um, uh, the sites that we have today. Like, for a good example in America would be uh, uh, Mount Rushmore, which is like right on the tip of my tongue, sorry. But Mount Rushmore is not just four, four, you know, four guys who 
uh, we're American and hey, they said, hey, who wants to be up here in a mountain? Let's carve your face. These are four American presidents. So that's kind of the reason that they're there. This is a section review from one of the textbooks we've used in the past, but I like it because it goes through some more detail than they, what they have in Strayer uh, or what Strayer has put in there. But it occupies a large territory, very fertile Indus floodplain. And there are some adjacent areas as well. And you can tell, like, if you look at the cities and where Harappa is, or Harappians are, or is way north. Um, both major urban centers and smaller settlements exhibit a uniformity of techniques and styles that indicate a possible strong central government. Are you going to have a uniform centralized kind of system, maybe in the way the roads are laid out or the the way the architecture was, if it wasn't someone telling you to do it that way? And maybe unless it's a religious or cultural um, way to do it but to me that does that is a good sense that there's a strong central government doing that in this valley people are technologically advanced because they have you great uh, examples of irrigation ceramics and construction like we mentioned with the agriculture or the architecture metals were more widely used there than other places so they had an advanced metallurgy or metal ability to use metal um, and uh, that's very interesting when you consider uh, more advanced than Mesopotamia or in Egypt. They had a uh, widespread trading contact and we've talked about that as far as Mesopotamia. Suddenly though in 19 or 1900 BCE and without really much notice and you could say that this is similar to the Mayans in a lot of way in a lot of ways we, we can make that comparison here uh, the Mayans are a little bit later down the road is that their cities were suddenly abandoned and the civilization declined very rapidly probably and possibly because of natural disasters or environmental changes now this is something that John Green brings up in the video about this as well um, what uh, the textbook and what Strayer mentions is this sal sal salination salination which is the salt in the water and the similar thing that happened some in Mesopotamia. So what you have is the irrigation systems maybe not being able to filter out enough of the seawater and that's getting into crops and it's destroying some of the natural ec ecology of the territory. John does an excellent job with the Indus River Valley civilization in this video right here. I definitely would watch that before the test and check it out. When and where did the first civilizations emerge? China is another one. And you see it right there on the top left side, the Yellow River, and it's in this um, maroon area, brownish maroon area, and it's the land occupied during the Neolithic era. And then current boundaries of China extend all the way around here, current being today. So what are we looking at here with China? This is a long history that's going to start today, and as we talk about it, and we will extend our discussion of China all the way through the end of the year and they're very similar culturally in many ways they have a kind of a, a, a Chinese way of life and a cultural understanding that has a lot of strength and it's lasted a long time they call this the Yellow River for a reason and there's some yellowish to a yellowish tint now it looks brownish here but the silt in the in the the water it gives it sort of that yellowish tint this isn't like yellow snow which you shouldn't eat by the way you may not be familiar with yellow snow but that's probably where the huskies have gone um, China's mother river at the bottom there mother how do you say it Huang He Huang He how about Huang Ha Huang Ha sounds better that is the statue there of like the Chinese mother mother river so the river giving birth to china itself that's what the statue is trying to say so we've got ancient china and the person above that is anybody 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 confucius say right or a confucian like image of someone who looks like confucius then early imperial china with the terracotta warriors classical imperial china and you go all the way through late imperial China and then modern China with the communists and that guy right there with the uh, huge forehead, Mr. Mao Zedong. So let's talk mandate of heaven briefly here. And I used to go into great detail with this, but, you know, I think you'll get the picture here. 
The mandate of heaven, how beautiful and unceasing. Oh, how glorious was the purity of King Wen's virtue. With blessings, he overwhelm us or overwhelms us. We will receive the blessings. They are great favor from our King Wen. May his descendants hold fast to them. Maybe not the most sing songy ish poem, but this gives you an idea of what the mandate of heaven might have meant to these guys. So a new dynasty is born, and a new emperor makes his way uh, into power. Um, I'm going to expand this here a little bit full screen as we talk through this one. You might get a better chance of seeing this. So check this out here and see how everything is working better in the empire for a while. And as you move around the circle, this mandate of heaven, things change. And I'll tell you that the mandate of heaven works in sort of a way that it gives rebirth to uh, situations that um, you know are rolling over China so leadership is changing hands and this is a way for them to kind of make sense of it as I let my dog out there for a second to go in the backyard um, new dynasty is born new emperor makes his way into the world and everything works for a while it, this new emperor has the blessings of heaven and their definition of heaven a little different than ours but let's not confuse you any more than you already are but this is sort of like having the blessings of God or the blessings of the universe another way of thinking of it so the government becomes corrupt over time as we're moving around the circle here or moving around the circle for you guys this way um, famine and natural disaster can destroy the common person's faith in the government we've seen this in America it's happened in the past uh, you may be familiar with Hurricane Katrina that was a pretty tough thing for uh, President Bush at the time to deal with and he made some mistakes and Louisiana made some mistakes and a lot of people paid the ultimate price for that and there were people very upset with their government and still are over the handling of that I would tell you that the same thing has happened it happened under President Obama we had another disaster befell uh, the coast of Louisiana with the BP oil spill and the handling of that wasn't always seen as appropriate either so commoners become tired of all the problems of the empire and so they revolt they go against the leadership and a dynasty is considered to have lost the mandate of heaven so we're all the way around sort of at nine o'clock now on the little wheel of the mandate of heaven and the current emperor is defeated and a new one takes his place the new emperor is at the top and sometimes this lasts for thousands of years this circle that goes round and round this dynastic cycle what you need to understand here is it's a process and it's a way that Chinese the Chinese will understand that it's time to look for new leadership now in the earliest days of China they developed a situation where they would look at the oracle bones to be able to tell the future to tell what's going to happen in the future to read the meanings of heaven or uh, the ideas of people so yeah, I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger so you can see inside the, the pit there some and understand it I'll pop it open full screen here what do you think you see inside there as I let my dog back inside here well those are the bones that have been sort of heated in the Shang dynasty had a fully developed system of writing preserved on br bone uh, bronze sorry inscriptions f from a number of other writings on pottery jade and other stones but most prolifically on oracle bones the complexity and the sophistication of the writing system indicates that an earlier period of development had happened along with this but evidence of that has yet to really be, be found and it's still lacking kind of similar in some ways to the Indus River Valley folks we know their writing system but we are not sure of its meaning and we're also not sure of the origins of that writing system in, in the Indus Valley so here's another way of looking at the mandate of heaven and 
and looking at it in terms though of state authority in first civilizations. You have the complexity of life in cities that require authority to coordinate and regulate the community and those enterprises, the fence and irrigation projects we've talked about. How about state authorities frequently use force to compel obedience? And we've seen that, obviously, with war. There's authority in early civilizations associated with divine sanction or the mandate of heaven for China. And that's the reason this is sitting in here. You had writing and accounting that augmented the state authority. It means it defines the elite's status and conveys prestige onto the literate. If you are a literate person who can read and to write, you're going to be in a higher class of society. Grandeur in the form of lavish lifestyles of those elites, impressive rituals, building of imposing structures, we've got all of those things adding up to a perception of state power and authority, which is something to behold, something to almost worship, and definitely something to obey. So you see here with all these little crowns, your world of humans, the king and aristocrats, spirits of past kings now regarded as deities. This is China too, so if you understand that. And then above them, the Lord on high, or Shangdi. Okay. The first emperor of China is named Qin, Shiwanji, and the last part is sort of right there. So it gives you a little clue into how they're thinking about the world and their surroundings. Of course, at the bottom here are more of those seals from the Indus Valley civilization. You see the different animals depicted there. Kind of almost like logos of sports teams, like this being Houston Texans seal or logo. You know who that is just by the logo. And that, of course, Dom Capers, first ever coach of the Houston Texans. Um, I met him downtown in the tunnels of Houston when I worked down there, and he signed that for me. That's even before the team was even born. And that logo right there, of course, is the Juniata Eagles. Now, when I played there, we were the Indians, but we have since changed our name to the Eagles, and I guess that makes good sense, and it matches our nickname, so we're good. Another fantastic video, and this will get you started with China. This goes to, through kind of the understanding of this long history of China, 2,000 years. So this is John Green's crash course. It's about 12 minutes on China. Something good to watch, but frankly, if it was me, I wouldn't watch this in this chapter if you didn't have the time. If you have some time, check it out. It's good stuff. In the beginning, of course, I think it talks quite a bit about their earliest days as a civilization. In the next unit, we'll come back to this for sure, and we may even watch this one in class because it's pretty important. This is fantastic, and I may show it here coming up because it'll be a great way for you to remember these Chinese dynasties. Um, and this is a uh, teacher in, um, Ho in Hawaii, and what she does, she has a partner that works with her and creates this. They're both teachers, and they sing songs, sometimes even well. And what they do is they try to make sense of hi history through some popular songs. So this is the song Vogue by Madonna, but it focuses on the Chinese dynasties. My students in the past have used this to remember how to, number one, say the names of the dynasties, but also to remember their order and their importance. Next, the Olmec, or the Old Mexicans is where, how I'd like to remember it. They're along the Gulf Coast of Mexico, nearby here in Houston, but they're nearby the present-day Veracruz in southern Mexico, and it kind of flows into Guatemala some and the territory down there. These huge, big stone heads that were like, how did that happen? How did they make these? We say the same thing about the pyramids, but we have some more proof about how they made them. They paid people to do them and do the work, and it took a lot of years and a lot of work but they were able to do it. And that's probably what's happening here with the Olmec heads. That are aliens, maybe. Maybe it's aliens, I'm not sure. But you see a lot of quintessential Olmec pieces having the Jaguar. I'm not a big Jaguar fan myself, being a Texans fan. But since they're no, no good as a team at this point, the Jacksonville Jaguars, 
Uh, whatever. We can say, hey, look at that great Jaguar. Um, so you get a sense of the Jaguar and a lot of their art. Um, the Olmec of Mesoamerica, of course, the colossal headed statue, some of them six feet high, five feet wide, and there are 17 of them that have been found. They're thought to represent individual rulers, and each of the statues has a very distinct and realistically portrayed face. In many ways, this is like a rolling or mobile Mount Washington or Mount uh, Rushmore. There I go again. That piano said Rushmore, but Mount Rushmore. It's very similar in some ways. They erected these huge, enormous heads, some weighing 20 tons. That is amazing. That's like, in some cases, 20 small cars carved from blocks of basalt and probably you know representing particular rulers somewhat later the mayan temple of the jaguar um, the giant jaguar is seen here or one similar to it this is near tikal and i'll tell you in probably february we'll do a little story about how the um, leader built two of these to face each other and on the equinox the uh, towers would end up kissing each other with their shadows and touching and they did this on purpose they knew enough astronomy to be able to do this and put this together and create it and it was thought that and it's believed that the king was in one and his queen was in the other and this is their way of of saying hello on every equinox and living on forever and that's if that's not love i don't know Love's got something to do with it right there. These are the classic sites and post-classic sites of the early Olmec. It becomes later the Mayans. And there's a lot of connection there as these uh, civilizations kind of flow one into the other. We'll learn more about the Maya uh, civilization when we get to Chapter 7 here in the next unit. This is a great video series on the Olmec heads. Part 1 of 5. Um, this, these are on YouTube. And again... My friends from, um, they're, I say my friends because I watch their videos all the time. Uh, the history teachers or music for history teachers on YouTube, the Olmex um, Bangles a September Girl. So, pretty good one there. It's okay, I guess. Let's talk about Norte Chico civilization. And if you're uh, keeping score at home, this is the last one. And it's the last one for a specific reason. <clears throat> they found evidence of this civilization when I was in college. So that may seem like a long time ago to you. It seemed like yesterday in some ways to me. But it wasn't until the late 1990s, and actually that's after I graduated from college, so I was living in Houston even by then. But the late 1990s, you're talking about any time between 95, 99 or so, that Peruvian archaeologists uh, provided the first extensive documentation of this civilization. And it has been newly classified after a 2001 paper in Science and a 2004 article in Nature that described the fieldwork and radiocarbon dating that gives proof positive that there was a civilization here at this time period which matches these other five civilizations in terms of date and time period of it happening. So before this, the Chavin culture around 900 BC had been considered the first civilization of the area, but now we know better. And it's a great example of what we've mentioned before in the course, early in the course, in the first couple of these lessons, that as new evidence comes to light, our understanding of history, our understanding of the world in history, and our world, and our role in our world changes, and it could dramatically change tomorrow. I mean, we could determine that there's an archaeological site in Atascacita, and there was an early civilization there, and wow, it, it'd be on, wouldn't it? They'd be excavating all over the place. I don't think that's going to happen because there's never been a find that dates radiocarbon dating wise or any other way to date and uh, to figure out what time period the remains were from that would be anywhere near it. But anything's possible. Until science has proven it, it may have happened. What's the Norto Norte Chico uh, civilization quite like? very complex pre-Columbian society, meaning before Columbus, that included as many as 30 major population centers. This is not just like one area or one city, and it's spread out. It's the oldest known civilization of the Americas and one of six that we have been discussing. Flourishes between the 30th century BC and 18th century BC before the Common Era. 
Um, Peruvian archaeologists were the first to find it and to do some documentation on it. If you look here, you can almost imagine what these mounds used to look like. They used to be more pyramid in shape. And that's the really fascinating thing about these early civilizations. Why so many pyramids? Think about it for a second. What's going on here? Aliens. Aliens? Well, anything is possible. But we haven't found any alien evidence, have we? What we have found is that early humans are developing agriculture around the same time period. They're worshiping gods and goddesses together very similarly around the same time period. And what is it? It seems to be human nature or the evolution of the human mind to the point where we could deal with the world and its surroundings and to get through it, we did things like this. Maybe to honor the dead among us or maybe to honor the very best of us. Real quick, a uh, couple pictures here to review some things. You've got the cuneiform tablet. Where is that from? Anybody remember? You've got Egyptian burial. Why did they bury the dead in the way that they did? At the bottom there, you've got the Ja Dynasty Flood Control Project. What's that have to do with? How do you get a large group of people to do a flood control project like an irrigation project? And at the bottom right or bottom left there, a Mesopotamian ruler engaged in warfare with a bow and arrow riding a horse. We'll see more of this here uh, down the road. That's the last slide for the chapter. Uh, I will probably do a video tomorrow that will cover how to write the FRQ. So that will give you a little bit of help there. But if you're having some questions or issues, always remember to shoot me an email and I'll try to reply and help you out with that. Good luck on the test for Unit 1. First humans, first farmers, and first civilizations. And until next time, don't forget to be... Hmm,